My name is Gia Ramos, and welcome to the first episode of Girl Innovation Talks. Today is September 18, and we celebrate World Water Monitoring Day. As an ambassador of the Earth Eco Water Challenge, we commit to educating our community about the importance of water conservation. Let me introduce my first guest. Andrea Contreras is a community-based science enthusiast and an oceanographer, passionate about working to increase access to ocean education and research. Born and raised in San Juan, Puerto Rico, she is currently finishing her undergraduate degree and working on her master's degree in the Earth Systems Program at Stanford University. She is, she is an and is thrilled to work to guide even more individuals in their experience with the underwater world. Andrea has worked on field research across Puerto Rico, the Virgin Islands, Hawaii, California, and the South Pacific, and has built content for youth summer programs that work with ocean and diving education. She is also growing a citizen science program called Project ZOA that uses photogrammetry as a tool to enable citizen science with coastal communities across the Caribbean. Hi, Andrea. Thank you for accepting our invitation. For me, it is a pleasure having you. So please talk to us about when this passion for the ocean started. Yeah, hi. Thank you so much for having me. Um, yeah. So. I guess I've been snorkeling and scuba diving since I was super little. Um, I live really close to the ocean, being from Puerto Rico, um, and I just thought it was the coolest thing. And the older I got, I started diving. I started taking more classes in marine science and kind of just learning more about it. Um, and I learned how important it was for like our ecosystems and everything in our lives to function. And it just got even cooler and more important. Um, yeah, so I guess I'm there. <laughs> Uh, okay. <laughs> okay, so can you give us a brief overview of what is water conservation? Yeah, so how I think about water conservation is kind of like two pronged. So we need to have enough water and we need to take care of that resource, but it's also no good if it's super polluted and it's not doing all the functions that it can. Um, so we also need to think about keeping it clean, keeping it flowing when it needs to. Um, and making sure that when it gets to like the oceans or like the crops that are gonna like feed you or the water you're drinking from your tap that it's clean and safe for you to drink um yeah so i guess it's about keeping the resource enough um, we have a super limited amount of water less than one percent of all the water on earth is fresh liquid water that we can actually drink um and then making sure that it's clean and safe yeah perfect uh, <laughs> so uh, what is climate change? Yeah, so a words. good way. Oh, yeah, yeah. In what? Sorry. Oh, in, in your own words, sorry. <laughs> yeah, so I think of climate change as an increase in the energy trapped inside of our atmosphere. Um, that's caused by increased um, carbon dioxide and other gases that make up the greenhouse gas effect in our Earth. Um, and the effect that that has is stronger storms, um, more unpredictable weather, more drought, um, more precipitation in areas that can't necessarily handle it. Yeah. So how does it affect our oceans? Yeah, so there's a ton of ways that climate change affects our oceans. There's two main ways that it does. One is because of like heating the planet up and increasing the temperature of seawater. The other one is due more to um, increasing the acidification of our oceans. So if you think about temperature, it's one of the first ones that comes to mind is increased like um, sea level. So that's because sea ice is melting, but mostly because um, as water gets hotter, it expands. So it's coming more into almost everywhere um, that there's a coastline. Um, then you can also think of like it affecting biology. So um, a lot of sea organisms, um, because water is warmer, um, they might not be able to live where they've been used to for a long time, so their range is expanding. So, like, there's some really cool, like, white sea urchins that are in Southern California, um, and you don't usually see them north of, like, Point Conception, which is kind of by L.A. Um, so I live all the way in San Francisco and go scuba diving in Monterey, which is substantially more north than that. Um, and we have started to see those coming up because the waters have gotten so much warmer. So, like, a ton of animals are changing their distribution. Um, we also get things like coral bleaching that affect anywhere that has like corals. Obviously, you get stronger storms. Um, yeah, and then something too that's like not as direct but also really impacts the oceans is because of climate change and hotter temperatures, agriculture becomes more um, 
unpredictable, and a lot of farmers tend to rely more on fertilizers and other nutrient additions to make sure that their livelihoods are protected. Um, so you end up with a lot more runoff in our oceans, and that can cause dead zones, like there's a huge one in the Gulf of Mexico um, that they track every year. Yeah, and then kind of to the other part, acidity-related, um, a lot of marine organisms have shells and different parts of their bodies made up by calcium carbonate, um, which is basically like what's in our bones. And when the ocean's more acidic, that has a lot harder time forming. Um, so a lot of organisms have way weaker body structures and need to use a lot more of their energy just to like grow and survive. Um, yeah, those are a few of the many ways. But, yeah. <laughs> Um, so before you said that only 1% of the Earth's water is fresh, but how much of the Earth's surface is actually covered with ocean water? Yeah, so about 70% of our Earth is water, and it's actually really cool if you're like on Google Earth or like um, Street View, you can do the satellite view and turn it and if you face the Pacific view, so um, what you see is the Pacific Ocean, like the whole Earth looks like it's covered in ocean, so most of it, yeah. <laughs> All right, so um, what are some examples of things that cause ocean pollution? Yeah, so a big one is plastics. Um, that's we're seeing a lot of that right now. Um, another huge one is nutrient pollution from agriculture and other farming sources. Um, so a lot of nutrients come into the water and that really messes up a lot of different kinds of ecosystems, especially in coastal areas, which is really important to us because as people, we really depend on these. Um, and then also you can think of like, um, like all the like carbon dioxide and other things that of my your ocean as pollution. But those are some of the main ways. Um, so where do those plastics come from? Yeah, so kind of everywhere. Um, so a, a lot of it is due to like inefficient or maybe like poor waste management structures. Not um, everywhere has good access to proper recycling and like trash collection. So a lot of times, like, it just gets picked up by the wind or a stream or a river and just kind of get carried into the ocean. Um, some of it is just, you know, like, sometimes you're, people are walking by the street, the trash can and the beach is super full, but they kind of, like, try to, like, edge that water bottle in there, and that can get carried off really easily. Um, it's important to note there's a lot of figures talking about how plastics and other forms of marine pollution come a lot from developing countries, but that's not really a super fair way to think about it because... Um, a lot of like times the, what they like manufacture, they manufacture products for the United States and other nations that are a little bit wealthier. So I guess it's kind of on everyone to think it's like a global problem. We're all really contributing to it and we all need to kind of work to make it better because like it can improve from anywhere. Yeah. Um, so do you know how much plastic there is in the ocean? So I looked up and there's a bunch of estimates on what it can be. Um, the figure that I found the most common was 150 million, right? Let me look up the number to make sure. I said, right, but it's 150 million metric tons, um, which is crazy. And we kind of produce about 8 million metric tons a year, um, which is kind of how I, I, that's a super huge number. And I have a really hard time kind of quantifying that in my head. But something I read that like struck me as we consume as people on average about a credit card worth of plastic um, a week, which is a crazy number. And that comes from like the water we drink, the fish we eat. Like, I think that's a really cool way to think about it. Like we have so much that like that much is coming back into our like system of our body, which is crazy. <laughs> yeah, so a lot of plastic. Yeah. Um, yes. Yeah. So how can we prevent ocean pollution due to plastics? Yeah, so one of the most important ones, like there's a ton of personal actions people can take and those are great, those are important. Um, it's a little bit harder because of the pandemic, but the most important things we can do are larger scale actions like voting and talking to corporations and holding them accountable. Um, also like being really careful about like what your waste management system is. Like I am currently at home in Puerto Rico because of the pandemic, but previously to this, um, I was living and going to school in California. And like the amount of things we can like recycle, compost, um, and like um, kind of prevent from getting into landfills are super different. So it's really important to look into that and make sure you're following those proper rules and not doing things like wishful recycling. But again, the most important is like voting and making sure that like we're making products that are built for circularity and that can be kind of like taken back into manufacturing so we're not like producing a ton of waste.
<laughs> okay, so changing it up a bit. Um, what are three factors responsible for water scarcity? Yeah, so um, a lot of it is um, water pollution. So um, when you have dirty water, you can't really use that. And that really limits the amount of access that we have to our fresh water. And like I said earlier, it's only like less than 1% of fresh water is um, liquid, like the less than 1% of all the water on earth is fresh and liquid. Um, we also um, have huge demands on water from agriculture. So like 70% of that water, I think is a figure that I've seen and worked with um, gets pulled out to go to agriculture. So like if it's used for that, people aren't really able to like, drink it or have direct access to it. Um, and population growth and just higher demands for water consumption are a big stress on that. Um, and something we really need to figure out because we have a ton, like billions of people on this planet and that rate is growing pretty rapidly. So, yeah. So can you say like three different ways we can help conserve water? Yeah, so a huge one is eating less meat um, because that has a really hard, high water cost. Um, a lot of water and energy and other things to kind of like raise a whole animal and like then like ship it wherever it will be eaten. Um, another big one is just buying less things and trying to buy secondhand when possible. Um, and a big one is reusing things like cutlery, plastic water bottles, cups, which like might not seem like it makes sense because you're like, damn, I have to wash this. Um, but like it takes a lot less water to like wash like a cup than to like ship it, like produce new plastic, make a product, ship it, use it, throw it out, dispose of it, like take care of the end of life. So those are three things that are pretty easy for people to do and can have a pretty big impact. <laughs> All right. Um, can you talk with us about your project, Project Zoa? Yeah. So I'm finishing up doing my um, thesis on this. But um, basically it came from, I worked at a lot of summer camps and have worked for a long time um, teaching scuba diving and leading dive trips. And something that really bothered me, or I guess I had trouble with that, was that first of all, um, a ton of people are going to these really cool sites, scuba diving, but they weren't collecting like data or information from it. So like there's a ton of things that we don't know about the ocean that we could have very easily collected figures on. Um, and the other one was that a lot of people who are from islands, like I'm here from Puerto Rico, and most of the people I took scuba diving are tourists who are visiting from like a cruise ship or like um, who are here for like a week on vacation. Same with the Virgin Islands. Like my friends like wouldn't go diving or snorkeling. Um, and like, I just really wanted people from their coastal communities to get more involved in like participating in the science and monitoring and observation. Um, like I'm the first person to tell you it's hard to like collect data underwater you need a good amount of training for it to be useful and for like the data to be correct um it's also really hard to get the hang of stuff you have to carry a ton of equipment you have to like learn how to be comfortable in the water um but um technology is a really cool way and tool that we can make that a lot easier for someone to like at their first or second time kind of like the main snorkeling going around and like um they're able to actually collect pretty high quality data and it's a lot more of a comfortable experience um, so I work with photogrammetry, which is a really cool process that you can like take a bunch of pictures of a surface. Um, so like a coral, like I've done some practice on like my friends like heads or their shoes just to like make sure all the software and the programs were working like when I was on <laughs> campus. Um, and you can get the image of the surface and it's really high quality so you can see like in some species like the grooves on the corals, which is really, really cool. Um, and from that data, you can get an idea of the structural complexity of a reef. So basically, like, if it's flat or if it's got, like, really cool structures, and that is a really good number that can help us sorry, identify the health of coral reefs. Um, so, yeah, I, and there's a lot of other ways that you can attach it to, like, existing projects that a lot of really cool groups are already doing. So, like, I've worked with groups that were interested in looking at, like, commercially important species, like conch, um, and like some kinds of reef fish. So like you can add that to the surveys that they were already doing and it's a really quick way for them to get some like pretty good visual data and like structural data on where they were going. Yeah, if you have any questions I can answer. That's them. super yeah. interesting. Mm -hmm. I love that. Um, so last question, uh, what are some people doing already to help with water conservation? 
Yeah, so there's so many places to actually look at, which is really exciting. Um, so there's a ton of student groups um, in different universities and across high schools that are really bringing this attention to their communities. Um, I was part of like a group when I was in high school um, that we raised a lot of um, education, like um, we educated a lot of people in school on that and we worked with communities in Puerto Rico who like didn't have access to drinking water. Um, and it was really cool because we like learned about a lot of other like groups all around Puerto Rico who were doing that. In college, I was also involved with our student sustainability group. Um, and we connected to a ton of others who were doing really cool stuff to, like save water in the campus and like teach people kind of how to work with like the like wherever they were to feel sorry wow that was like a kind of but like to work to use less water and to think more about like where their water came from um but i don't know there's a ton of really cool groups like intersectional environmentalists is one that i've been like seeing a lot lately um they kind of came out in the past few months um and it's bringing a lot of different voices who are already like really powerful and present in the environmental movement um, and kind of bringing all their work together to a place that's a really cool like community where people are learning um, and kind of seeing all the different ways to care about places. Um, I don't know, just a lot of really cool, and there's a lot of really cool like design innovations to like be able to increase our access to water and like filter it and use it more effectively. So yeah, it's super exciting to see all that. <laughs> that's so amazing. Well, um, thank you, Andrea, for accepting our invitation to Girl Innovation Talks. It was a pleasure talking with you. So for more information about Earth Eco International Initiative, please visit monitorwater.org. And if you want to know more about Girl Innovation, please visit girlinnovation.net. Have a great day, and thank you for watching.